Oh, also in the, I only saw like the, or listened to the preview and they do something talking about Gram Schmidt orthogonalization. Yeah, they're probably so, for uh, the projection of the, so. so there are things that if you took linear algebra that you should have at least seen a little bit, maybe done a couple times. So there are some stuff you may recognize. Uh, so anyways, you might see a couple errors in the movie as well. And if you're a space nerd, I think uh, there was like a gravity movie that was that had a lot of problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's depending on how nerdy you are, these different things, movies are not real. All right. So we're doing second derivative. <coughs> Ooh. Let's get the other pen. So we're going to do two derivatives. Now, the way you want to think about these derivative operators, you could write it as uh, d over dx squared. Uh, but the way you want to think about it, each derivative operates on what's to the right. So if you sort of over parenthesize, it will look like this. So take derivative of y, the x derivative of y, and then take the x derivative of whatever, in, whatever that derivative happens to be. So we could write it ddx, y prime, and let's see, we had some y prime up here, or dy dx. So we're basically going to look at this, uh, this term right here in the middle. So we're going to write ddx of, and we'll use that dy dt. Divided by dx dt x dt. All right, so to do the second derivative, actually, we'll write it in a slightly different way. So let me erase all that stuff I just wrote. You could write it like that. You probably can't erase as fast as I can. You can cross out too. I think I told you crossing out is way better. Plus everybody sees how much eraser shavings are on your desk, <laughs> especially after a midterm. They can count your misery. Make sure you wipe up tears after your midterm if there are any of those. All right, so we could write it as the T derivative of y prime, like this. And you could rewrite it d dt of d dt, ugh, d dt of y. Divided by dx dt. So you'll find one of these forms to be more useful, maybe two of these forms to be more useful depending on what you're doing, and those should make it on your uh, cheat sheet. So let's go ahead and do an example. So we're going to find a tangent to a curve. Tangent line to curve. So we've done this before, but not in parameterized form. So we'll take t. Now we, we need a small interval because obviously anytime you're doing with sec dealing with secant or tangent, you can be divided by zero. So you got to be pretty careful. And I said uh, you want to make sure whatever domain you're using, both functions are defined in that domain. So if I secant is, God, why am I blanking? And cosine, one over cosine, and tangent is sine over cosine. So the good news is they'll both be undefined at the same t values. So I don't, we won't have to worry about, if it was cosecant and tangent, I'd have to be super careful about where we were going. Uh, we should be able to go between negative pi over 2 
and positive pi over 2. That's where u would be divided by 0. And we better leave it open because at those values, we'd be divided by 0. Uh, if I, wanted, I said usually we're going to go with closed intervals. If I wanted to close them, I would have to pick uh, numbers closer to 0 for the endpoints. So I couldn't go all the way out to those two. All right, tangent line of the curve at square root 2 comma 1. So we need to do three things. I need to find the t value to, I need to take derivative, find dy dx, and then three, uh, plug in the uh, actual t value to get slope. Then write our y equals, I'll just write it as mx plus b for now, so things will seem familiar. All right, how in the world do I find the t value? So that's part one. How do I figure out what t value gets me to square root 2, comma 1? Yes. What's that? Yes. Could guess, yeah. So uh, we have, I want to know, I, I want to know x of which t and y of which t will equal square root 2, comma 1. So anytime you're setting one point equal to another, there's really two equations happening at the same time. There's an x equation and a y equation. So I need x of t equals square root 2 and y of t to equal 1. So x of t is secant t, and y of t is tangent t. All right, take 20 seconds and figure out what t makes these equal. And make sure it's between negative uh, pi over 2 and pi over 2. So don't give me some 5 pi over 3 or whatever. Make sure it's in the right interval. Don't need a calculator ever. <laughs> well, except your homeworks, they have bad numbers. All right, who's our trig champion? Pi over 4. It's probably easier to see with tangent. Uh, the other way, secant is 1 over cos t. So what would be the reciprocal? So this would be square root 2 over 1. So if you reciprocated this, you'd have uh, cos t equals uh, 1 over square root 2. So hopefully that'll bring back some good memories. Pi over 4 is our t value. And it better work for both. Tangent of pi over 4 is one also, because your x equals your y value right there in your unit circle. So I don't want to draw the whole unit circle out and all that fun stuff. All right, that's part one. Part two, this is the calculus part. dy over dx. So which form do you want to use? There's a few choices. Let's go with, uh, I could do the dy dt over dx dt. So let's do uh, this one I just circled right there, dy dt over dx dt. So I have two derivatives I need to compute. So what is, y is tangent, right up here, y is tangent. What is derivative of the t derivative of tangent t? Secret squared. So hopefully these are on the tip of your tongue and you didn't get too, your winter break wasn't too long. What about derivative of, so dx dt is, oops, I should probably write x somewhere. Uh, x is secant, yeah. What is derivative of secant? Secant tangent, secant tangent. all right. So it'll be sec t times tan t. Now we have two t's in a row, so make sure they mean something very different. 
the T is not the same as the other T right there. So one way to fix this is you can use a parentheses. Oh, I can't really fit parentheses here. Let's pretend like I wrote it like that. <laughs> but I think you get the point. You want to be careful about you know, your T's being next to each other. Another way to fix this problem is you can just leave some extra space like that. And don't put a plus in the middle, and hopefully you'll know multiplication. You can also wrap them up like that as well. Secant tangent. Oh, I could change the order too. That'll work also. And then the, yeah, that. Yep. All right. So this is our derivative, dy dx. So what happens if I just write uh, my equation of a line? What's wrong with writing this? I really need I really need a number for my slope. So how do I get a number out of my derivative? So pick a t. There's one t I need to pick, which is r pi over 4. So I need to use my correct t value. So derivative first, plug in the t equals four sec uh, pi over 4 second. So we use this notation, this vertical bar with a little t equals 4 at the bottom. That means take the, deri take the derivative and then evaluate at t equals pi over 4. So that's what that vertical bar means. So that little vertical bar, t equals pi over 4, means evaluate at t equals pi over 4. And all you have to do, take what we just got, secant squared of pi over 4, divided by secant. I could have reduced a little bit, second pi over 4, and pi over 4. So I'll just reduce right now. So one of these secant squares cancels the entire secant. And I think we already figured out secant and tangent of pi over 4 somewhere. So our secant is square root 2. And our tangent is 1. So our slope is square root 2. All right, questions on plugging that in. So plugging it in feels very different now because you're plugging in a t value and into both your sort of separate derivatives and then dividing. All right, so that's our slope. So y equals square root 2. x is outside the square root 2. It is not square root of 2x plus b. All right, so figure out what we need for b. How do you figure out how to, what b should be equal to? Um, what do we need to use? So we need x and y value. So where's, what is our x, y value? It is not pi over 4. Square root 2 comma 1. So that is our original x, y value. We use that to get t, but that's our x, y value on the graph. So we're going to use uh, our particular x, y is square root 2 comma 1. So go ahead and figure out what b should equal. Um, as you're doing that, I will graph this.
So I'm sure you know typing in on on-screen keyboards is pretty miserable. I can't make this any, oh, there we go. All right, so all I graphed was the original parametric. Now, when I did that, I had to make sure I went and added a, it just defaults to a regular XY function, so I had to go down to choose parametric. When we go and do polar, you're going to go and pick, obviously, the polar uh, right there, and then use R's and thetas. And I think you have to spell theta in here. But parametric, we use the letter T, foo plot, just defaults to S. Uh, S is the other most common letter that they use for parametrics. All right, so this is our curve. What was your final? Obviously, it was uh, y equals, equals uh, square root 2, S Q R T parentheses 2, parentheses, x plus, all right, what was your b? Minus 1? All right. Minus 1. So hopefully, invalid. Uh-oh. I think, I think, yeah, they, they just want the, hopefully, the second part of that. All right. So when you're doing a lot of this work, it can feel very nebulous. And it's nice to have a graphical representation of what's happening. So our point was square root 2, comma 1. Is that right? Yeah, square root 2, 1. So square root 2. Now I have to zoom in. Uh-oh, that's the wrong kind of zoom, I think. All right, I can't do everything I want here. But I think you can see go over, let's see, go over square root 2 and up 1. I don't know that they're going to let me, that little thing I'm trying to click on, that point right there, is where our line meets our curve. And hopefully, if you, they won't, oh, maybe I can, uh -huh. Uh-oh. Ah. All right, the point is if you zoom in close enough, you will see that the slope should match really close with the actual curve itself if you were able to zoom in properly. Uh, maybe I'll bring a mouse next time so we can actually interact the right way. But I think you understand. Do, is it pretty clear what I'm trying to do? Yes. Okay. Sure? Is it USB? Yeah. Score. Oh, no, I can't. If I unplug my microphone, it'll probably crash the video recorder. <laughs> yeah, I think I left my mouse at home. My Bluetooth mouse, yeah. All right. Anyways, you have an imagination. So I think you understand. All right. I personally like Fooplot a little bit more because it lets you zoom in and out, I think, a little bit nicer. But uh, Desmos will probably, you'll be able to do the same stuff in Desmos as well. I don't know if asteroid is the official name of this curve. It probably is. Uh, but it, that's what it's called in your calculus book. So there are two ways you can see a parametric curve written. So this uh, I wrote as x comma y equals one function comma other function. So the x function comma y function. The other way you might see it written is the way I did it for the previous example somewhere, which is just x equals a function of t comma y equals a function of t. So there are two ways to write the exact same information. So you want to just be comfortable either way. So we could graph this out, but this is a function we've never seen before. So I'm just going to sketch the graph for us. Uh, how would you sketch the graph if I actually wanted you to do so? Plot points. So we did that in the 11.1 .1 section where we graphed actual curves. So I think uh, we want 0 to 2 pi, so probably 0 
you could try to get away with pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, go with all the fourths instead of trying to hit the sixths and the thirds, and you'll spend a whole lot of time. So if you plot this out, it looks a lot like cosine comma sine, just the first powers. We know one cubed is one and zero cubed is zero. So these four points are going to stay the same. So whenever it was zero or one or negative one, those won't change. So instead of tracing out the standard circle like that, what happens if you cube a number that is between zero and one? gets smaller. Unless it's negative, then technically it gets bigger, but it gets closer to zero. Um, I like to say smaller, talking about negative numbers closer to zero. So instead of having a curve that bends outward, this curve is actually going to bend inwards like that. So for example, 1 over square root 2 cubed is, gets even smaller. So it'll be whatever, 1 over 2 square root 2 if you cubed it out. So it'll be a smaller number. So this curve will look something like this right here. So again, you could go on FooPlot and plot this out really quick, or Desmos if you wanted a, a more accurate graph, but we won't need a super accurate graph for this. All right, I could shade in the area. And I want to know what is the area here. So did I tell you anything about area and parametric curves? Sure didn't. So how in the world are we going to do this? So we're going to do an integral. So that should be. That part should be sort of obvious, but what integral is the tough part. So back in the good old days, it looks like, now normally I would say don't write y's next to x's. So let's write here, I'll put inside of a cloud, this will be the good old days. Uh, we had y equals f of x, so it was basically integral fx dx, right? That should be, and then you figure out what your endpoints are. There'll be x endpoints. In this case, this particular one, negative 1 to 1. And we integrate across. Uh, ooh, we have a problem. We'd have to figure out top and bottom and then subtract top from bottom. So that would be kind of a pain. Uh, how can we use symmetry? So we can go, we cut in four pieces, it should be the same uh, area in four pieces. So we're going to go uh, four integral, and I like to keep it positive, so we'll go zero to one, and we're really just going to go uh, fx dx. So I'll use the black marker here. If I can get that area, I'll just go four times and then I'll get the f our full area. So why can I not just go with this? <coughs> I sure don't. Uh, so I don't know y as a function of x. So you probably could solve for it, but then you're going to have like probably inverse trig cubed of other trig and all that fun stuff. That doesn't sound very fun to me. <coughs> so what we're going to do is very carefully rewrite this for uh, integral y dx. All right, easy question, what is y? Y is sine cubed. So that's the easy part. So first thing you'll notice, we're using t's. So we better not be using x's. So what in the world do I do for dx? So what we know is x is cos cubed t. So what I want 
is dx. How do I figure out what dx is? Take derivative. All right. Now the question is, what derivative? So I could do, if I did an x derivative, you can always take any derivative you want. I could take a z derivative, but I would get 0. Uh, but I could take an x derivative. So let's go and hit this with a ddx, which is what we did mostly in Calc 1. I would get 1 equals. Now we have a little trouble. I'll have a chain rule. So I would get cos squared t uh, times th 3 times negative sine t negative sine t times d t dx. So I have some chain rule. Uh, and then I have an implicit derivative at the very end that I have to worry. I took an x derivative of a t function. All right, so that is the x derivative. There's another option. Let's take the t derivative instead. So, so this is bad. Let me put a uh, x through this. So we're going to go d d t of x equals cos cubed t. All right. So I'll do the left side. You do the right side. <laughs> dx dt equals, so get the derivative of the right side. And remember, you could rewrite this as cos t cubed. Might make you more comfortable so you can see the chain rule happening properly. You need to deal with the cube before you deal with the uh, cosine. So go ahead and take your derivative. So calculus questions. There's really a calculus one problem that we've done so far. All right, how do I, so I want dx. I want to know what is dx. So what do I have to do to solve for dx? I see dx, it's on the left. Just multiply by dt. So dx equals negative 3 cos squared t sine t dt. So isn't that almost the same thing as before, except we were just multiplied by dx times the I, side? You probably could solve for dx. You could multiply dx on both sides and get the same thing. Yeah, yeah, actually we could have, yeah. So you can go either way. Cool. So I recommend it, at least to me it makes more sense to go the way we went. It feels a lot like a use of I guess you'd probably call it a T sub or a, so like maybe it's closer to actually a uh, trig sub back from uh, Calc 2. All right, so that's dx, which of course is way too big for me to fit where I originally wrote it. So area equals, I will try to, you know what, let's write it even lower. I need the extra space. or integral sine cube t, that was the easy part, times negative 3 cos squared sine t dt. All right, so that integral, it doesn't look friendly, but it looks doable. What is the other thing I need? So obviously, I'm going to have to take an antiderivative. But before I do that, what do I need to <coughs> do to my uh, integral before I start doing calculus? So before I had endpoint 0 to 1, what variable? I'm going to put two values here, but what variable are these values going to be in? Yeah, so there's going to be t's. We're doing a t integral, so I get t values. So I need one t equals and another t 
equals. All right, how do I get these t values? So I'm going to scroll back up. What I want to do is go from one of these to the other. Now, if I go from 0 to something, I will be going, I will orient my curve to the left. All right, so how do I know this is t equals 0? Because I've done a lot of trig. t equals 0, uh, cos is 1, and sine is 0. So I'll be right there. Anybody want to take a guess at the t value at the top? Let's try pi over 2 and see if it works. All right, so what is cos of pi over 2? Zero. zero, zero cubed is zero. And then sine pi over 2 is 1, cubed is still 1. This is the right t. I just want to warn you, if I plugged in, I think, 5 pi over 2, I would also be at that point, except what uh, I would have traveled around the entire figure and then that little bit. So if I did 5 pi over 2, I would have done an entire lap and then back up. So you want to be a little bit careful. So we're going to go 0 to pi over 2. Now you need your calculus 2 skills because we have to integrate. So let's simplify it before we integrate. Area equals, so 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Integral 0 to pi over 2. Sine cubed and another sine is sine to the fourth. Cos squared. How in the world do we anti take the antiderivative of this? Uh, U sub is the easiest tool when it works. So the only, we might be able to U sub this if we're super clever. I think a U sub will work, uh, but only because we're lucky. What? In, pre -calc er, in calculus 2 class, what technique would we use for high powers of sines and cosines multiplied? Yeah, so this is, there's three cases. If one of them was odd, you would sort of exploit that fact and then use the cos squared as um, uh, 1 minus sine squared. You would convert cosine to sine and all that stuff. Uh, when they're both even, things are difficult because you, can't, you don't have one of them hanging around. So this is case three, and I think it's 8.2, I want to say, from your book. Anybody have the book? It's, it's not trig sub. I think there's a trig section right before trig substitution. I want to say it's 8.2. What is it? 444. Page 444. All right, so that is uh, the sort of difficult case of all those. So that one takes a little while, and I don't want to go through all those steps right now. Uh, but I think there is a use of that actually works in this case. And it's not one that you might guess. Anybody want to take a stab at what might work? Oh, no, it won't work. No, I don't think U sub's going to get us out of this. I was thinking of sine cubed, but the derivative of sine cubed is not cos squared. It doesn't have a cos squared in it. It has a, si it has a sine squared times cos to the first. So I don't think a clever U sub is going to work here. All right, so I'm just going to write dot, 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 <laughs> which means you need to finish this. So if you forgot chapter uh, 8.2, it's a good time to go back and review. Uh, this is the hard case. So if you can do this one, you could probably do the other ones. Um, and this is in, inside your textbook, too, so you can follow along in there. But if you don't remember 8.2, it's a really good time to go back and redo 8.2 before this class gets too hectic. 
What's the name of that section? Is it just trig integrals? So it's not trig substitution, which I think is 8.3. So overall, if I had to explain calculus 3, you're basically applying calculus 1 and 2 to pretty much changing coordinates. So a lot of what was you know, regular y is now a function of t. What was dx is now, unfortunately, a much more complicated function of t with a dt in it. And so you're using everything we did in Calc 1 and 2. You're just stepping up the dimension. So all the fundamentals are the same. And it will feel like you're doing a whole lot of uh, more like you're messing around with lots of different variables with all the same rules. All right, arc length, that is another thing that we used before. But of course, now we're going to do arc length with parameterized curves. So instead of arc length with just the y equals f of x, so before in the good old days, we used a square root. And I think we did a 1 Does that look familiar? I think that's right. All right, so this was before. Uh, there was an alternative form that we're going to use instead. So let me write that down before I put the bubble around this. Integral square root. Oh, and where does this come from? So we got some curve. We go from uh, one point to another. We, we want to basically figure out, we're estimating using straight line segments, which is where all this came from. So if we make a triangle here, we're basically going to use delta x, delta y, and then our uh, delta length is square root delta x squared plus, and you may want to go extra parentheses, delta y squared. So that is our length of that little straight segment. So that's where all this stuff came from. So one way to write this, uh, delta x is now going to be dx dt. And D, uh, delta y is going to be now dy dt. So if we had delta x squared plus delta y squared, and there would be a, how do we write this? I think it was still dx before. OK. So the formula we're going to use now, so this is parameterized. So we're going to have a square root dx dt squared plus dy dt squared with a dt at the end. And I'll still use the uh, a and the b right here. So that, remember, a and b are t values. So if you need to write t equals a to t equals b, totally OK to do. Uh, but hopefully, you either already learned that dt integral is going to be using t values, and dx integral would use x values and all that. So you probably don't need to write those t equals t equals parts. So 
So that is the parameterized arc length. All right, so the asteroid we just looked at, we just did the area. We didn't compute the area, but we got close to computing the area. We got to a point we could ask Wolfram to solve it for us, at least. How do I get the perimeter of the asteroid? It's a really bad asteroid. It's supposed to be symmetric. <clears throat> All right, can I use symmetry? Yeah. Yes. So let's go with symmetry. Good news is I already know t values for the first two points here. So we're going to go that direction, t equals 0, t equals pi over 2. All right, so that's a and b. We have our x equals cos cubed t, and our y equals sine cubed t. So what do I have to do before I can plug in the expressions to our parameterized arc length? So I know x, I know y, what I need is dx dt dy dt. So all I have to do is take some t derivatives of each of these. So go ahead and compute these. You're going to get definitely some chain rule happening. You're going to have to square them, so you might as well just do that at first right here before you plug them all in. Any calculus or algebra questions? So that's a really ugly integral. What can I do before calculus? So we'll simplify, use some algebra. So I can definitely factor a 9 out. And I'm going to do some things in one step. So 9 factors outside the square root is a 3. 9 is uh, 3 squared. And that's a constant. So I could bring the 3 all the way outside the integral. What else can I factor out? Cos squared and sine squared. So I can get a cos squared and a sine squared out of here. 
Now, they're both squared, so I could bring them out of the square root just as cos and sine, not squared. So that's cos t, sine t. Now, I don't recommend you do all this factoring and bring things out of the square root and all this at one time. But we're running out of time, and I want to get through this problem before the end of class. What are we left with? All right, and why is that fantastic? It's one. It's one. Square root of one is one. So if you're feeling fancy, you can cross it out because you're multiplying. If I was adding, a plus one is not the same as plus zero. So multiply by one, the same as not doing anything. All right, can you integrate cos t sine t? Hopefully. So this is another one I'm going to write dot, dot, dot. That one should take way less time. That should not be very hard at all. I think that's a, I think that's just a u sub, right? Yeah, u sub.